Okay, now we're going to start dealing with chapter 24, the urinary system. When we talk about the urinary system, the urinary system organs are the kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. Now their functions include adjusting blood volume and blood pressure, regulating blood plasma concentrations of sodium, potassium, chloride, and other ions. Uh, they will be involved with stabilizing the blood pH. They will be involved with uh, conserving valuable nutrients by preventing their loss in urine. And they're involved with removal of drugs, and I might add also drug metabolites, as well as toxins from the bloodstream. The metabolites are important because of the fact is that some drugs, as they're broken down metabolically, maybe partially still have uh, some physiological activity. And the other fact is that many of you know that we've moved since the 1980s to do drug testing. And a lot of times what they do is they use urine. Well, some of the uh, urine tests are not looking for drugs per se, but the metabolites of them. And that's why it's important um, because some of those tests can give a false positive or false negative, mostly a false positive. If you consume certain products that uh, will be metabolically similar and give a false positive to certain key target drugs, okay, the illegal drugs we're talking about. As you can see here, we're in the location of the kidneys. You have ample blood supply to the kidneys and leaving. Above the kidneys are the adrenal glands. And you will see that you have the ureters that deliver the processed urine into a storage, which is a temporary site called the urinary bladder, and then it exits out the urethra. Now the kidneys are paired are paired retroperitoneal organs. What we mean by retroperitoneal is that they are literally behind the peritoneum in the back or posterior part of the abdominal cavity. Now there is a term which is an acronym for all the organs that are in this retroperitoneal classification. Uh, the acronym SAD pucker stands for supraadrenal glands, otherwise known as adrenal glands. Aorta and inferior vena cava, duodenum, pancreas, ureters, colon, kidneys, esophagus, rectum. When we talk about the gross anatomy of the kidney, we have this indentation on the side of it called the hilum, which is really the entry and exit for blood vessels, nerves, and the ureter. Connective tissue layers supporting the kidneys include um, the fibrous capsule, which is a layer of collagen fibers that cover the outer surface of the entire kidney. The perinephric fat, otherwise known as perirenal fat capsule, which is a cushioning thick layer of adipose tissue that surrounds the fibrous capsule. And then we have the renal fascia, which is a dense fibrinous outer layer that anchors the kidneys to the surrounding structures. As you can see here, here we have the adrenal glands, and that's why they call them supraadrenal because of the fact that they're above but on top of the kidneys. And you can see here the ample blood supply, both uh, the arterial supply and the venous supply, as well as the indentation there, the hilum. Let me get this a little bit more clear. You'll notice that these are partly protected, the kidneys, uh, by the 11th and 12th rib, which is really the floating ribs. You will also see where the kidney is encapsulated by this um, uh, fat and fascia that kind of protects it. And it's behind literally the spleen. And you'll notice also that really to cause an injury to the kidneys, requires a certain amount of force uh, that would be remarkable in some ways because you really have to, to bear down hard to go beyond the parameters of the, the skeletal muscle, which is here, as well as the ribs.
And here are the layers, of course, the fibrous capsule, the perinephrotic fat, and then the renal fascia. Kidneys are complex at the gross uh, anatomic level and the macro microscopic level. The major landmarks of the kidney include the fibrous capsule, also lines the inner cavity of the kidney. It's called the renal sinus. You have, of course, the kidney, the, the renal cortex and the renal medulla. But then you deal with some of these unusual structures, uh, the renal pyramid, which is pyramided shape. Uh, it's more conical structure that extends to the renal papilla, which is the tip of the pyramid. You have the renal column, the kidney lobe, the minor calyx, the major calyx, and the renal pelvis, which you'll see right here. Here's the renal pelvis, sort of a centralized site that leads into the opening of the ureter. You can see here uh, the renal sinus, which is where some of the blood vessels are moving out into. You have, of course, this whole structure here, which makes up the kidney lobe. And that's composed of uh, the renal pyramid, the renal uh, papilla, which is sort of the tip here. Uh, you have the cortex around here, as well as the medulla, which really is making up the bulk of the renal pyramid. Why this is so important is that you're going to notice there's a difference between uh, the nephrons, which are really the critical key element for the function of the kidney. Some of them dip down deep into the renal pyramid, others do not, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But you'll notice here that you have the minor calyx and then the major calyx. And you can see this here. This is sort of the opening after the uh, urine has dripped down from the renal pyramid tip into the minor calyx and then it empties into the major calyx and then it moves down through the renal pelvis and into the ureter. Now, the nephron. This is where all of the uh, filtering, reabsorption, secretion occurs. There are two types of nephrons. Cortical nephrons, which make up about 85% of the total number of nephrons, and the juxtamedullary nephron, which is about 15%. The key point here is that they have longer nephron loops that extend deep into the renal medulla. And you can see this difference right here. Here's a cortical nephron. Here's the cortex. They all start off with that. They dip a little bit into the renal medulla. Here, though, much lower is the juxtamedullary nephrons, which start off in the uh, cortical uh, renal cortex, but then dipped very, very deeply down. And we're going to show you how some of this process is occurring here. And eventually, both of them end up uh, delivering the filtered and processed urine, the, what they call uh, the tubular uh, filtrate, into these collecting tubes. Right down here at the tip is the renal papilla. Okay, and then it empties right into the minor calyx. Okay. Now, a nephron <clears throat> is divided into segments. Each segment has specific functions. So you have really the renal corpuscle, which consists of the globe, uh, glomerular capsule, as it formerly was called and still is in some uh, books, the Bowman's capsule. You have the glomerulus, which is this little tuff of uh, wrapping of capillaries. It's the capillary network. And then you have this capsular space which is between really the glomerulus and the, and the outer edge of the capsule. And the capsular space is continuous with the lumen of the renal tubule. The filtration at the renal corpuscle produces a filtrate, which is similar to blood plasma, okay? You're really not supposed to have huge pla uh, uh, plasma proteins. You're not supposed to have white blood cells or red blood cells in the filtrate. And when you do see that, heads up, that's a, that, that could be indication of some very bad situations that are occurring uh, for the kidney or for the tubule or for the blood, okay? Keep that in mind. Once we leave the glomerular capsule, the tube goes into um, this area that we call the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal meaning that it's very close to uh, the glomerular capsule, okay?
certain activities occur there. We're going to call it shortly called the PCT. This absorbs nutrients from the tubular fluid. Okay, once you leave the capsule, that fluid is now referred to as tubular fluid. Now, then we have this nephron loop. This is also referred to as the loop of Henle, and it is the continuation of this tubule leaving the PCT. It has a thin and a thick limb. The thin is, most of it is descending. It starts to turn upward, and then you have the, the tubule get uh, very thick, the, the, the nephron loop limb. And it establishes an osmotic gradient, which we'll show you the importance of that in a minute. Then after we're done with the loop of Henle, the nephron loop, we start going into the structure, the continuation of the tubules called the distal convoluted tubule, DCT. The DCT adjusts the composition of the tubular fluid. So let's go over that again. Renal corpuscle here. This is the glomerulus here. Okay, you've got afferent uh, arterial, basically blood being delivered in. You go through this filtration process here in through these blood vessels, but it's a little bit more complex than that. I'll get into it in a minute. The blood will leave through the efferent uh, arterial. Now, the filtrate is collected in here in the capsular space and starts moving forward. It goes into the proximal convoluted tubule, PCT, and you start having some unique properties occurring. One of them is that some of the solutes will be reabsorbed. Uh, keep in mind that whatever is in that filtrate will include water, sodium, potassium, uh, some other minor ions, glucose, as well as urea. Now, urea we want to get rid of. We don't want to save that. Water, though, you want to save. Glucose, you want to save. To a degree, you want to uh, save sodium, and to a lesser degree, potassium. We'll get into some of the other details in a little bit. After you leave the PCT, you have the descending nephron uh, loop, which is mostly a thin. You have a short period of ascending thin limb, and then it gets thick. And then we move from there into what's called the distal convoluted tubule. When I talk about convolute, it's sort of like folded around, wrapped around, looped around. But you see, everything can become somewhat deceiving until you look into the cells that make up the parts of the tubule because they're going to play a role in either uh, reabsorption or secretion. Eventually, the fluid leaves this area and it's delivered into the collecting duct, which then moves into the papillary duct, and then it moves into basically uh, leaving the area completely of that renal pyramid. Notice you have arrows here pointing that some uh, reabsorption of secretion is occurring here and there. We'll get into those de uh, details afterwards. The collecting system consists of the collecting duct and the papillary duct. Now, collecting system. The collecting duct carries tubular fluid through the osmotic gradient in the renal medulla. And it consists of two types of cells. Intercalated cells, which are cuboidal cells with microvilli. Microvilli? Yeah! Those extensions increasing the surface area and thereby increasing the capability to secrete or reabsorb both hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. They also have principal cells. These are cuboidal cells that absorb uh, water and secrete potassium ions. Sorry about the typo there. We also have the papillary duct, which collects tubular fluid and delivers the fluid to the minor calyx. You can see in here the design of the renal corpuscle. You have the capsular space, you have some of the uh, capillary cells which make up the glomerulus. There's also some other important cells, the podocytes, which we'll get into in a minute. Then we move into the PCT, and notice the PCT's got a bunch of microvilli here, and all those little speckles that you see next to the nuclei, those are all mitochondria. You're going to have a lot of uh, active transport, which means you're going to have a lot of need for ATP. Okay, then we're going to go into the nephron tube. Here's the thin limb. Ah, looks barely like you've got your cells holding it together. Thick limb, again, a lot more unique chemistry occurs through here. Then we move to the distal convoluted tubule. Again, some unique properties here. We move to the collecting duct, which has intercalated cells and the principal cells here. Notice that you have microvilli. 
and then we get to the papillary duct, which is basically moving those the uh, fluid through. You can see some of this in this uh, micrograph here, the collecting duct, the thin ascending limb, the the uh, that's the thick ascending limb, the descending thin limbs. Look at them, the difference. Barely cells holding up together. Certainly not thick. More, which you would kind of call a squamous in approach, whereas these are more uh, what we might consider cuboidal. Okay. Now, the kidneys are highly vascular, and the circulation patterns are very complex. I'm going to go over the basic, what I would call the piping. Yes, you have to have some understanding of this. The arterial system consists of, of course, the renal artery coming off from the descending aorta. Then you go segmental artery, interlobular artery, arcuate arteries. Off of them are the cortical radiate arteries, which go up into the cortex. And then you have the afferent arterioles. Now, at the afferent arterioles, you come up to this point where you then have the afferent arteriole deliver blood to the glomerulus. But it's not going immediately to a venous system per se, because when you have the, the blood leaving the capillaries of the glomerulus, they don't totally go immediately to a vein, but they go to what's called an efferent arteriole. Efferent arteriole means that it's leaving the glomerulus but you have another capillary network that's going to play a critical role. But before I jump into that, let me take you out from uh, the capillaries that have been this secondary network and get you out of the kidney itself. So capillaries, uh, cortical radiate veins, arcuate veins, interlobular veins, renal vein. Then you go into the inferior vena cava. The nephron circulation patterns, as I said, are very critical. You have the afferent and then you have the efferent. The afferent arteriole um, basically will supply blood to the capillaries of the glomerulus. The efferent arterioles move blood to one of the two types of capillary systems. If you have a cortical nephron, it goes to what's called peritubular capillaries and then to the vein. If you have a juxtamedullary nephron, remember that's only about 15% of the total number of nephrons, you're going to go to peritubular capillaries, then to what's called the vasa recta. It's a long straight capillaries. They're parallel to the nephron loop, and they surround the nephron loop. Then you'll get to the cortical radiate vein. As you can see here, we have renal artery, segmental, interlobular, arcuate, cortical radiate, Afferent arterioles, glomerulus, then you're going to get into uh, some other patterns here of the capillaries, then to the cortical radiate veins, arcuate veins, interlobular renal vein. But here's the trick. If it's a cortical nephron, look at how the pattern of the blood flows. Afferent, then you have the glomerulus in the renal corpuscle, leave the efferent. Efferent always leaves. Afferent always comes toward it, just like the afferent uh, nerves and the efferent nerves, okay? Now, efferent arterial delivers blood again, and you'll notice that it goes around a bit into what they call the peritubular, surrounding the tubule, down, and then back up, and then out to the cortical radiate vein. But Juxtamedullary, a little bit more complex here. Afferent arterial, then you have the glomerulus. The efferent arterial kind of bundles up all over the place, the peritubular capillaries, and then they drop down deep. And these are the capillaries of the vasa recta, because these are going to do a lot more complex reabsorption, bringing water back into the blood flow, bringing some of the ions, etc., in, and then they will ascend reformate into or, or deliver the blood into the cortical radiate vein. I hope that helps. So let's talk about what the kidneys do. They maintain homeostasis by removing waste and producing urine. The three important metabolic wastes. One, urea. We've talked about this before. It's most abundant byproduct of amino acid breakdown. Two, creatinine, or excuse me, creatinine. 
Creatinine is generated by the skeletal muscle, and it is a breakdown product of creatine phosphate. Okay, if you remember that, go back to the muscle muscles, and you're going to go through the steps of how you start extracting energy out. You have uh, creatine phosphate, which is sort of a, a shortened uh, intermediate uh, startup fuel to help regenerate ATP. But then we have uric acid. That's that little tricky one that's formed during the recycling of nitrogenous bases from RNA molecules, okay, purines. This is has a real low solubility, and fortunately, we have a low production of it unless you have a diet rich in purines. And also, uh, you may end up with other problems if you don't have a proper uh, water consumption, et cetera, and proper functioning kidneys, but we'll get into that later. Now, the kidneys are capable of producing concentrated urine with an osmotic concentration, this is osmolarity, of 855 to 1335 milliosmolars per liter. What am I saying here? Goodness gracious alive. Think about it this way. You produce every day 180 liters of filtrate, yet you only excrete out 1.8, or about that, liters of urine. In other words, a lot of that filtrate gets recovered back. And what is absolutely essential to be excreted shows up in the finished urine. Now, there are three physiological processes that do this. Filtration, absorption, reabsorption, excuse me, and secretion. Here's a way to think about it. If you were to take raw filtrate, which is pretty close to blood plasma, you're going to have lots of sodium, a modest amount of potassium and some bicarbonate, but when you look at urine, it has a sizable amount of sodium, a quite sizable amount of potassium, and a modest or very, very low amount of bicarbonate. Now, let me just help you to think about this, okay? As we were going through evolution, sodium was absolutely essential to survive on, so we don't want to lose it. Potassium, <clears throat> It didn't matter, folks, because it was everywhere in our diet, in fruits and vegetables and everything else, so we could afford to excrete it. We didn't have to be as careful. Sodium, we were very stingy in getting rid of, okay? Glucose, look at glucose in the blood plasma, 70 to 110. But in normal functioning, healthy human beings, in urine, it's very, very low. As a matter of fact, diabetes... Um, mellitus really refers to sweet urine. And yes, I think I mentioned this before in class. In the very early days, we'll say 16, 1700s, 1800s, if a doctor wanted to determine if the patient was diabetic, yep, they'd taste a little bit of the patient's urine. Now, another way to do it is that uh, in the 1600s, I believe it was, if someone urinated, Right around them, they would have lots and lots of flies because they would be attracted to the glucose that was spilling out of the urine. But in a healthy person, they have these uh, urine reuptake mechanisms, and so you're going to have very, very little glucose in your urine, okay? And if you notice the numbers for the nitrogenous waste, the same situation. You want to get rid of urea as much as possible. Uh, cre uh, creatine creatinine is going to be excreted extensively as uric acid and ammonia as well. Okay, so let's start about how this process works. You have the glomerular capsule, you have blood pressure, and so that's going to force through basically this filtrate membrane, which consists of basically uh, the capillary blood cell, the basement membrane, and the podocytes, and out comes the solutes. You're going to have water, as well as some of the solutes. That's going to make the raw filtrate. Um, you have the peritubular fluid, the tubular epithelium, the tubular fluid. Solutes can get transported back, and you can have them going from peritubular fluid to tubular fluid. Basically, we have these capabilities of certain transport proteins downrange in other parts of the tubes that are going to help process the filtrate as well. As I said, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion occur in the specific segments of the nephron. Filtration, that's 
pretty much going to be in the glomerulus. Reabsorption occurs in the PCT, descending, descending. Now keep this in mind. Different behaviors occur in descending or ascending. Descending thin limb of the nephron loop, ascending thick limb of the nephron loop. But what about secretion? What I mean by secretion is it's going to go back from blood or from the fluid surrounding the tubule back into the filtrate, okay? And that's secretion. That occurs in the DCT, and, and some of it occurs in the collecting duct. Now, you have what is referred to as variable water reabsorption. That occurs in the DCT and the collecting duct, too. We'll get into that a little bit later. The blood vessels. Well, the peritubular capillaries uh, basically do the redistribution of, of water and solutes reabsorbed in the renal cortex. In other words, they'll take away some of this that we pumped out of the raw filtrate. The vasorecta, though, is involved with redistribution of water and solutes reabsorbed in the renal medulla and stabilizing the concentration gradient of the renal medulla. I'll show you about the concentration gradient very shortly. So here we have this. We're getting a little bit more involved here. You can see here is pure filtration occurring here, okay, in the glomerulus. Now, as we have the fluid moving out, we call it the tubular uh, filtrate or tubular fluid. And what you're going to start having is water reabsorption here, PCT. You're going to also have some solute reabsorption. You're also going to have solute, uh, basically, oh, excuse me, variable solute reabsorption or secretion. Happens a little bit in PCT. What you have mostly, though, is some reabsorption, meaning you're going to get rid of it from the filtrate, but you're going to have it picked up by the blood bloodstream, okay, by the capillaries. Now, the filtrate continues. One of the interesting things that occurs, this is part of another concept of countercurrent systems. As you go down, you're going to pump water out. So the solute concentration as it descends in this descending thin limb is going to increase. And then what's going to happen is it starts going back up. Then you're going to notice something else. You're going to have solute reabsorption. In other words, You've made this more concentrated as you went down by just removing water. Now what you're going to do is reduce the concentration, particularly reducing sodium, potassium, etc., by basically pumping out some of the solutes. Then it gets into the DCT. This is where we get into really some interesting things because you're going to have secretion of ions, acids, drugs, and toxins. In other words, we're going to pump it back in at the DCT level you're going to have a variation of reabsorption of water, sodium ions, but calcium ions. This will be totally under hormonal control. So this gets variable here. Then we go into the collecting duct. Now in the collecting duct, okay, this is where you have what's again called the variable reabsorption of water. In other words, some water may get pumped out. You may have either some pumping out again of uh, further sodium, potassium, hydrogen, bicarbonate ions, or reabsorption, depending. And so you end up with delivery of the urine, which is in its final state, in the minor calyx, and then it heads out to the urine storage and elimination. Now, renal structures and their functions, I've mentioned this before, you can do use this chart as a review. Keep in mind that basically you'll notice the structural differences of the tubules going from uh, the renal corpuscle to the PCT to the nephron loops, thin and thick, then to the DCT, and then to the collecting system. You also need to know the important other two players, which are the blood vessels, the peritubular capillaries and the vasa recta. These are going to take part because, you know, if you sit there and say to yourself, okay, fine, I have my filtrate, I pumped out these ions, where do the ions go? I pumped out this water, where does the water go? It goes into the capillaries so it can go back into the blood. I've said that basically filtration occurs at the renal corpuscle. Filtration membrane of the glomerulus consists of the following. As I said before, it's the capillary walls, okay? The endothelial cells. The podocytes, these are unique cells that kind of wrap around the capillaries, but they have spaces in between them. Now their extensions are called Pedicels, these are fo uh, foot processes, 
but they have these slits in between them for filtration and actually between the podocytes and the capillary walls is a basement membrane relatively thin and so it processes things and becomes sort of a semi-permeable membrane again that's why you don't get huge amounts of red blood cells or huge blood proteins going into the filtrate because of this semi-permeable membrane and if you do if you do have red blood cells white blood cells or large protein showing up in the urine you've got a problem there's some pathology going on now in the juxtamedullary complex that consists of specialized cells that secrete renin what happens is right around the point where the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole pass through each other or come close to each other just before they come to the uh, glomerulus you've got this little complex that's there it consists of the macula densa the extra glomerular mesangial cells and the glomerular uh, the juxtaglomerular cells jg cells as they're referred to what's going on there we're going to get into that in just a little bit the glomerular capsule has an outer wall of renal corpuscle and basically covers the glomerular capillaries basically it's a thin layer you have a capillary space that holds the filtrate now the intraglomerular mesangial cells they adjust the capillary diameter and the rate of capillary blood flow so here afferent arterial coming in you've got the macula densa cells right here notice that what's happening here is you're passing right by this little complex here includes the distal convoluted tubule okay you've got these really special cells the extra glomerular mesangial cells here and then you've got this little band of cells coming into and coming up against the afferent more the afferent than the efferent and these are called the JG cells, juxtaglomerular. These are going to play a key role in adjusting the blood flow. If the blood flow is too low, they will institute uh, dilation of the afferent arteriole. Look at the smooth muscles here. You can basically cause them to relax. If you have too much blood pressure, you can have vaso uh, constriction here by having the constriction of the smooth muscles here so basically what you're doing is allowing a control of the pressure both entering and leaving okay and you want that because you want to keep up consistent filtration if you have someone that has too low of a blood pressure you're not only going to be concerned about um gee are they going to be conscious or not are they going to pass out or anything but you're going to also want to have them check for kidney function because too low blood pressure means that there's not enough pressure to allow for normal filtration okay let's move on here are those podocytes that i was talking about here and you notice they're their little extensions here and in between the red and the blue you can see what we would have are the slits and those slits will allow for the fluid to pass in between okay so you have the basement membrane you have the these capillaries interestingly enough are fenestrated meaning that they're very thin in certain points of the membrane and so you have these pores you have the fluid going through the basement membrane also the slits filtration slits here between the foot processes and that is what you're going to have for really the filtration membrane now we got to talk about numbers we did this a little bit before glomerular filtration deals with several different pressures one of them several oppose the actual key pressure amount necessary to provide filtration the main pressure that we need to talk about right off the bat is glomerular hydrostatic pressure in other words the pressure that you have from the plasma or from the blood as general going through the capillary that's the ghp it's related basically to blood pressure but then you have the opposing forces one of them is the blood colloid osmotic pressure bcop this is opposing filtration because really it's the force that draws water back into the blood due to the amount of blood proteins and other solutes in other words because of all the solutes that are in the blood yes your solvent water would leave but you have also the capability to have it come back a bit because of the the concentration of osmotic 
uh, materials, the solutes that are in that blood. Also, you have the capillary, uh, capsular hydrostatic pressure, CSHP. It's opposing the GHP also. It results from the resistance of the filtrate already present in the renal pelvis. In other words, you've got sort of a back pressure. So how do you determine net, net filtration pressure? This is pressure acting across the glomerular capillaries, the average pressure pushing water and solutes out. What you have is you start off with your GHP and you add together the BCOP and CSHP. So GHP minus that summation gives you really the net filtration pressure, which you would see right here. Net filtration pressure, so many millimeters of mercury. Here's where you're going to get some of that resistance that I mentioned a minute ago, the capsular hydrostatic pressure. Here you're going to have also the resistance caused by the blood colloid osmotic pressure because you have plasma proteins and solutes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the bigger products, which would be red blood cells, white blood cells, et cetera. Now, if you don't have the fluid going in this direction, then you've got a problem here because you've got no filtration, okay? The capsular coll uh, colloid osmotic pressure is usually zero because this moves quickly through. Keep in mind, you're going to have some of the cilia there helping it, okay? Now, the glomerular filtration rate is the amount of filtrate produced each minute. Glomerular filtration rate, GFR. So that's the amount of filtrate the kidneys are producing each minute. When you say rate, always think about it as a sense of it's a measure with time in this case. And so to control and stabilize the GFR, you have several of these control mechanisms. One of them is autoregulation. That's the local controls. You also have central regulation. That's the endocrine component initiated by the kidneys, and the neural component is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. What am I saying here? Simple. First, you've got the local controls, the afferent and the efferent arterioles. They're going to control some of the pressure, keep the pressure up so the GFR is going at a certain rate. But you have endocrine control by uh, angiotensinogen, by antidiuretic hormone, etc., and they're going to play a role. The when we say it's initiated by the kidneys, that's usually with renin, and they're going to play a role in how much blood is going to the kidneys, etc. But the more significant one here is the neural component, which is the sympathetic nervous system. Now, for those of you that forgot what this happens. The sympathetic nervous system, when it's activated, you're not going to make as much uh, urine. As a matter of fact, it's totally opposite to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest, you know, uh, diuresis, defecation, and digestion. Sympathetic, the blood is getting sequestered or it's being pushed more to skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, brain. So therefore, the pressure is going to be reduced to the kidneys at the time. If you're being chased by lions and tigers and by bears, oh my, you don't want to have to worry about urination. You want to keep the blood pressure up, and you're going to also reduce, as, as a means of that, uh, the filtration that's occurring in the kidneys, okay? Now, here's the points of homeostasis. I encourage you to review them, as you can see how these sections play a role in this. This is the autoregulation. Afferent arterioles, efferent arterioles. You can basically do vasoconstriction, vasodilation, uh, depending to basically maintain the pressure to, uh, of the blood going to the glomerulus to basically control your uh, filtration and your glomerular filtration rate. These parts here will discuss the endocrine response and the nervous system response. And keep in mind, such as what I mentioned before, this um, JG complex, which is right here, the juxta glomerular complex, will play a key role coordinating responses if you have a decreased filtration rate. And they will initiate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, RAAS. Aldosterone, you know, is made in the adrenals. Angiotensin will play a role and help trigger aldosterone secretion. 
and basically will keep up elevation of the pressure necessary. And renin is released in these cells to the blood to trigger this angiotensin production. Okay, let's move on. Let's get into reabsorption for a few minutes. This predominates uh, along the PCT, whereas also you have some reabsorption and secretion that's often linked along the distal convoluted tubule. Just a review of a couple of basic concepts. Remember that PO, oh, excuse me, it's not supposed to be COS, but CO2. Carbon dioxide plus water gives you carbonic acid. And remember that carbonic acid can break down to hydrogen ions and car bicarbonate ions. This plays a role in the pH of the blood. Now, remember that carbonic acid is also uh, increased in its synthesis by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, okay? In PCT, you're gonna have a lot of reabsorption. So right off the bat, once you've filtered it, you've gotta start pulling back glucose, you gotta pull back water, you're gonna pull back some of the sodium and potassium, et cetera. But when you get to the DCT now, you've passed the loop, you're gonna have a little bit of reabsorption. Again, you may have some secretion. Particularly what's gonna be secreted will include things like drugs, toxins, and drug metabolites. When I say secretion, think about it as being returning back to the filtrate. When I say reabsorption, think of leaving the filtrate, recovering it. Sodium is re retained wherever possible. When we were evolutionarily developing, sodium was not available. In other words, in food and plants and everything else. Now in modern society, it's everywhere. But sodium at the time was not as much available, so it was a survival advantage to retain as much sodium as possible. Potassium, pfft, it's everywhere, guys, fruits, vegetables, etc. So, yes, yeah, so that's why I include my funny little noises, etc. But it's everywhere, so it doesn't matter if you lose some of it. In your next meal, you'll probably take back a, a certain amount, okay? Now, here's where we get PCT. You're going to reabsorb water. Concentration of the solutes is going to increase. Solute reabsorption further. Okay, so glucose, sodium, potassium. Go down the nephron loop back up. And you can see where a lot of these ions are going to be having a, a role. They will eventually, as we pass through the paratubular fluid, the paratubular capillaries are going to take back sodium. Uh, they're going to take back water. They may take back bicarbonate ions if hydrogen ions are brought into the tubular fluid. Okay? But the key points that I want you to walk away from, glucose, other organic solutes, they're going to basically be pumped out and brought back into the blood. Okay? So far, so good. Distal convoluted tubule. This is where it gets interesting as well. Because here, first off, toxins and drugs pumped right out of the blood back into the tubular fluid. Okay? You have these antiporters. Remember, antiporters are basically transports where one ion goes in one direction, another ion goes in another. Here you have sodium that's being pumped out of the fluid back into the blood. Meantime, as sodium gets pumped out, potassium can get pumped in. You, you basically have a transfer of ions there. And as I said, you can lose potassium. You can afford to lose potassium. Sodium, you can't. Notice also here, sodium is recovered, but instead what you do is you pump hydrogen ions in replacement. Okay, so far so good. Notice the little A there. That's an aldone, aldosterone regulated pump, which means that this hormone plays a role on the function of this particular transporter to allow further loss of potassium, further uptake and saving of sodium. Now, what about the limbs of nephron loop? Okay, the exchange between these creates an osmotic concentration gradient in the renal medulla. This is where we have another countercurrent here. <gasps> Get that countercurrent sheet that I, that I showed you earlier. It's in week 10, okay? It's in the content section, week 10. And as the tubular fluid descends in the thin tube, the osmotic concentration of the fluid is going to increase, meaning that there's going to be a lot more solutes and a lot less water. Why less water? Because the water is being pumped out. 
as the tubular fluid begins to ascend, go back up along that thin and thick tubule, the osmotic concentration will decline. Ions of sodium and chloride are going to get pumped out. So as the fluid begins moving up those, the uh, ascending tube, both the thin and the thick, particularly the thick, you're starting to pull out the solutes now. First, you were pulling out the water on the descending end. On the ascending end, you're, you're doing uh, pulling out uh, the solutes of sodium and chloride. Okay? All the time, the urea concentration is increasing down and up the loops and then through the DCT and the collecting duct. Okay? And you can see that right here. See here? Water as we go down. So the concentration de uh, increases here. As the concentration, as you start going up, the filtrate starts losing ions here. There's going to be a concentration gradient that increases and gets stronger and stronger as we drop down through the length of this tube. And as we move upward, we start pumping out the ions at different levels. And you can see this. But meanwhile, urea stays. We got to get rid of urea. That's the bad stuff. I mean, it's the nitrogenous waste, okay? Now, this is the interesting thing that when they started studying the renal medulla. As you look through the tube and then outside the tube, the concentration of ions gets very, very high right at the bottom. And as you move up level by level by level, what happens? Well, first off, let's start here. The descending is permeable to water. It's impermeable to solutes. So what happens is as you remove the water, you increase the concentration of solutes. Then as you start going up the ascending tube, the thick ascending limb is impermeable to water. So you're not going to have any more change in the water, but it's selectively permeable to sodium and chloride. And so what happens is now you start seeing the pumping out of the solutes, sodium and chloride, and so the osmolarity decreases again, gets back up to about here, 100. When you're about here, this is now you're going to be dealing with the DCT, if you notice over here. But they have a variable permeability to water. And that permeability, hint, hint, is controlled by antidiuretic hormone. But we'll get more into that in a minute. You'll notice also that as you go down this collecting tube, the outside here is changing its concentration gradient. If you pump out, the concentration of the filtrate here gets greater and greater, and then eventually leads into uh, being collected at the renal papillae and eventually into the minor calyx. Okay? Now, urine volume and concentration are hormonally regulated. Urine volume and osmotic concentration are regulated throughout the hormonal control of water ab absorption by antidiuretic hormone. Blah, 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 blah. What did you just say, Dr. Roberge? Real simple. You go out with your friends. <clears throat> Ready? You go out with your friends and you go to a bar and you have a beer. And pretty quickly afterwards you think, uh-oh, because I had the liquid of the, the uh, beer, I've got to go urinate. So you excuse yourself and you go to the uh, restroom. It is not because you consume the fluid immediately that you have to go to the, to the bathroom. What happens is alcohol shuts down the posterior po uh, pituitary uh, releasing antidiuretic hormone. No antidiuretic hormone, no selective re, uh, reabsorption of water. So the urine becomes more watery. As the urine becomes more watery, you produce, in essence, a more dilute urine, which fills up your bladder quite quickly, and you have to go to the restroom, okay? Antidiuretic diuretic hormone, ADH, plays a key role in controlling this. Now, what, there is actually a disease caused by the lack of ADH. It's called diabetes insipidus, meaning very, very dilute urine. It has nothing to do with insulin. It has basically you are producing prodigious amounts of dilute urine each day, up to 40 liters. That means that you have to keep consuming water all the time. 
and either that or face some serious water loss vo of water volume loss and dehydration. Usually this can be controlled by drugs now. Um, and what I mean by that are usually analogs that are similar to ADH. Persons take uh, the uh, drugs and they are able to control the water loss. Now the obligatory water reabsorption, this is water movement that cannot be prevented and it occurs in the PCT and the descending loop. And that's important, okay? Facultative water reabsorption, this is where the water movement can be altered via ADH. The influence is on the DCT and the collecting ducts. And by the way, if you haven't remembered this from ANP1, there are these unique water channels, proteins that are on the cell membranes. They're called aquaporins, and they are actually the water channels that allow water to go in and out of the cell. Okay? And here we have it. The obligatory, meaning it's mandatory, cannot be altered, etc. That is in the PCT and the descending loop. Facultative, controlled in part by ADH. This is in the DCT and in the collecting duct. Okay? And you can see how we had this working out there before. We've talked about this. Antidiuretic hormone calls the shots. If you fail to have antidiuretic hormone, and by the way, caffeine can also do some ablation of ADH uh, release as well. What happens is you end up with a highly dilute urine and you produce large amounts of it. <laughs> if you have antidiuretic hormone, you will produce a smaller volume of very concentrated urine. Now, let's go over urine for a couple of characteristics. We you saw some of this in the lab. The specific gravity of it is 1.003 to 1.030. Remember, specific gravity is comparing the uh, density of the material to the density of pure water, which would be 1.000 grams per milliliter. Now, the pH of normal urine is in the range of 4.5 to 8. Its average is 6. Some individuals that tend to have uh, all vegetarian diets tend to have a more alkaline uh, urine. Um, and those that uh, have more uh, a diet that is more robust in meats, etc., they're going to have a more acidic urine, but doesn't mean anything in the sense of abnormality or anything else like that. We talked about the osmolar concentration. The water content is 93 to 97%. Color is usually pale yellow. Remember, that's urobilin that, that provides the coloration of it. Uh, the odor can vary with the composition. If it's brand new, it's going to be slightly aromatic, but that's it. When you store it for a while, then you start having bacterial degradation. You may pick up a, a smell of uh, ammonia. Okay, Urine, for the most part, in a healthy individual, is supposed to be sterile, no bacteria. Renal function. This is an integrated process. It involves filtration, reabsorption, secretion. And as I said to you before, keep in mind, you are producing every day 180 liters of filtrate, but it's reduced to 1.8 liters excreted each day. Most of the glucose, water, sodium, potassium, and bicarbonate ions, a lot of these are recovered, and, and yet you also include the excretion of nitrogenous wastes. The urea transporter is present in the papillary duct to maintain ure, uh, urea concentration levels with the deepest part of the medulla, okay? The deepest parts of the medulla will be down here. Here's where you have the urea transporter. You've got to keep a certain amount here, all right? Remember that the regulated permeability or the facultative is all throughout here, and it's all controlled by ADH, okay? Let's talk about renal failure. This is a very serious situation. It's life-threatening condition. Uh, renal failure is when the kidneys cannot filter waste from the blood and can no longer maintain homeostasis. Now, you have several different situations here. If they say chronic renal failure, this is the kidney function deteriorates gradually. Uh, management via diet can slow the progress, but not necessarily stop it. Acute renal failure, this is the filtration suddenly stops completely. This is sometimes due to renal ischemia. Urinary obstruction, trauma, nephrotoxic, nephrotoxic drugs, 
this can persist for weeks unless the kidneys have been destroyed in the process. Now, by the way, nephrotoxic drugs, here's a heads up. Antibiotics, some of them, have been found to cause damage to kidneys over a prolonged period of time. So that's why it's important to keep on top of patients with selective uh, antibiotics that can cause adverse effects. Having them on blindly without giving them warning or just telling them, you know, let me know if you have any change in, you know, your urine stat urine production or urine status or anything else like that, that's important. We have, fortunately, technology now that allows us to do what we call hemodialysis. This is uh, basically a therapy that cleans the blood of waste via dialysis. We have a passive diffusion through a selectively permeable membrane, and you basically run the blood through the membrane, and basically you've got on one side of the membrane the waste, et cetera. On the other side of the membrane, nothing, and so you're going to have this passive diffusion into the area where the concentration is very low. Now, there is a term that's called shunts. These are basically tubes that provide access ports to the circulatory system. Okay. Now, here is an example of the artificial dialysis membrane. Obviously, small ions can go through, organic waste can go through, large plasma proteins cannot. Okay. You have um, basically the comparison of the plasma and the dialysis fluid. Notice that uh, you will lose some uh, glucose. You will also have uh, some of the ions that are transported across, but this is far more acceptable than watching someone unfortunately die. Here is the pulsatile blood pump. You have basically a shunt. It's inserted into a medium-sized artery, and the redelivery of the blood that's been cleaned is put into a vein back into the person. Um, and basically what happens is you run this dialysis fluid through, and as it's running up and through this, you're going to have the blood uh, depositing or transporting um, waste, etc., through the tubules, and into the fluid, which is then dis disposed of. By the way, I need you to be aware of something also. Dialysis is not really just for patients with kidney problems. It can be used to help individuals who have consumed and have now into their blood system certain toxins. It can help remove that, particularly toxins that might um, basically cause more serious damage to the person before the kidneys can effectively remove them themselves, okay? So in other words, you can have a healthy patient, healthy renal system, but to get the uh, dosage of the toxins out, uh, someone consumes methanol or isopropyl alcohol or some other type of alcohol other than ethanol. That is one way to get it out of them fast before they end up having the toxic effects of those particular alcohols or the substances, okay? Now, let's talk about the urinary tract as we start moving toward the conclusion of this chapter. The urinary tract is basically involved with the transport, storage, and elimination of urine. So the structures include the ureters, which are muscular tubes that extend from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. These are also retroperitoneal, but you need to be mindful of the fact that they have smooth muscles in their tubes that basically will propel the liquid along via peristalsis. The urinary bladder it's a hollow muscular organ. Now, when I say muscular, again, smooth muscle. It is basically a temporary reservoir for urine, and the walls will have transitional epithelium. If you remember that, great. If you don't remember it, go back to Chapter 4 and go over your histology. The transitional epithelium, there are multiple layers, okay? But what happens is, as they stretch, the cells that look nice and round will kind of thin out, become almost like a striated, uh, le basically a squamous striation, as opposed to somewhat more cuboidal or round in the cell appearance. Because basically what it is, is that the bladder is a large, you almost want to say a balloon, but it holds liquid instead. And as this structure holds it, as you stretch out the, the walls, the walls kind of expand and thin, but they still hold their contents. 
The urethra extends from the neck of the urinary bladder to transport urine outside the body. Male and females have certain structural differences. The male's urethra also is involved with the transport of semen, which we'll get into later on in reproductive uh, chapter. Here we have a pylorogram, and basically what it is is it's a radio-opaque fluid, and as you can see, it's collecting nicely here in the renal, pelvis, etc., travels down through the ureters, and then collects in the urinary bladder. This is how doctors may be able to tell if there is a blockage in the ureters or in the large or minor, uh, the minor or major calyxes, okay? Here is the outline of basically from the bladder, okay, uh, from the ureters to the bladder, and then out by the urethra. Now, the urethra is longer in the males because it has to pass through uh, both the prostate as well as through the penis, okay? The ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra are specialized to conduct. Um, urine. You have to keep in mind that urine has a lower pH on average, it's, and so you're going to have some supporting structures, etc., involved. Uh, you're going to have also some modifications of the actual walls to handle the acidity um, and the unusual ca characteristics of the urine. What I mean by that is, the, you know, the iron ion concentration and things like that. When we talk about supporting structures for the bladder, we have different supporting ligaments. The lateral umbilical ligaments pass along the side of the bladder to the umbilicus, the navel. The middle umbilical ligament extends from the anterior superior border toward the, uh, toward the umbilicus. Now, if you don't have the balloon, I'll use an analogy of a balloon. If you don't have the balloon filled up with air, it's going to be kind of wavy on the inside, etc., as it's deflated. Same thing in the urinary bladder. You have these rugae. These are folds in the bladder line. They allow for expansion. As the, the urine fills up, the folds will recede as the bladder gets bigger and bigger. Now, there are layers of smooth muscle called detrusor. These are external and internal layers of longitudinal smooth muscle. There is also a circular band in between both the external and internal layers. And basically, when they contract, this is when you are actually expelling out urine from the bladder. The uretic orifices are slit-like openings that prevent the backflow of urine from the bladder. So when the, the expansion occurs and when you start having the contraction, the slit-like openings will shut quickly so they don't have a backflow of urine from the bladder up the ureters. There is a unique structure called the trigon. It is a tri triangular area bounded by the uretic orifices and the entrance of the urethra. Now, the neck of the urinary bladder contains internal uh, urethral sphincter. Uh, this is made of smooth muscle. There's going to be an internal and an external one, so heads up on this, okay? The internal one provides involuntary control over urine discharge. The external one is a skeletal muscle band and that controls the voiding of the urine. Now, the ureters consist of the mucosa, which is combining uh, the transitional epithelium with the lamina propria, okay, so a basement membrane. The muscular layers, as I said before, are smooth muscle layers, both longitudinal and circular. And then you have an outer connective tissue layer that's continuous with the fibrous capsule and the peritoneum. Now, in the urethra, uh, we have stratified epithelium. This progresses from transitional at the neck of the urinary bladder to stratified columnar at the midpoint to stratified squamous at the external orifice. Now, you have some mucin-secreting cells present to protect against the urine acidity. Here you see this here. Here are the uretic orifices. Here's the middle umbilical ligament, the lateral umbilical ligaments, the detrusor muscles, and you can see the layers here, okay? And then, of course, you've got the ureters coming down here, but they enter sort of in the back, sort of the posterior part, all right? The trigon is this area you can see here like a triangle. Two points of the uretic orifices and then comes down to the opening uh, of the uh, 
internal uretic sphincter. Now, only in males do they have this a prostate gland, which is right below that, okay? And this is where the urethra will come. Underneath the urethra is the external urethral sphincter. This is going to be skeletal muscle and control uh, urination. And don't let me forget also about, as you can see, these folds here. This is the rugae, okay? Now, when we get into the ureters, Smooth muscle here. The mucosa consists of basically transitional epithelium and underneath it a lamina propria. So basically this will squeeze and help ex uh, propel by peristalsis, the con coordinated contractions, the urine down into the bladder. Okay. If you look at the mucosa here, you have the transitional epithelium, the lamina propria, submucosa, the detrusor muscle area here, and then the visceral peritoneum over here. Okay? Let's talk for a few minutes about urinary reflexes. Uh, these coordinate urine storage and voiding. We talk about the term urination. Another term for it is called micturation. Now, there are some higher centers of the brain involved, but you have to be mindful of the spinal reflexes that are involved. There is the pontine storage reflex. Now, when I talk pontine, this is in the pons of the brainstem, okay? And this inhibits urination by decreasing the parasympathetic activity and increasing the somatic motor activity at the external urethral sphincter, okay? We'll see this in the diagram next. So that's the storage reflex. Well, what about the micturation reflex. And this is where we're talking about urine voiding. Um, you stimulate the increased parasympathetic activity. So in that process, what happens is the detrusor will contract. The internal urethral sphincter will relax. Now, of course, also you've got to keep in mind that you're not going to have any backflow. So this is all being propelled out of the urethral, the internal urethral sphincter. You're going to also decrease sympathetic activity. Remember, you really are supposed to have uh, urination during parasympathetic activity. Okay. Rest, digest, uh, uresis, diuresis, excuse me. And you're also going to decrease the somatic motor activity. So that's where the external urethral sphincter relaxes. Here is the pontine storage center in the pons, which goes down through uh, the spinal cord, which causes the external urethral sphincter to contract. That's going to stop everything. The internal urethral sphincter will also contract, but this is by a different routing system, including the autonomic gam ganglia. Okay? You're going to inhibit contraction of the detrusor muscle. Stress receptors in the bladder are going to feed this information uh, both through the autonomic reflex here as well as back up to the pons if necessary. Okay, this is the storage reflex. Here is the micturation one. This is where the detrusor contraction is less inhibited. You're feeding information from the muscles back up to the pons, and you have the, a separate uh, center called the pontine micturation center. This information will be passed over to cause the relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter. And as the detrusor contracts, you will also have the relaxation of the external urethral sphincter. Urination occurs. Now, we got to talk very briefly about urinary disorders. These can often be detected by physical examination or laboratory tests. I've showed you the uh, pilogram earlier. Pyelonephritis, this is a kidney infection, and you a lot of times will end up with inflammation to the kidneys. The term renal canicula is another way of saying kidney stones. Now, by the way, kidney stones can occur in a very healthy individual under very unusual situations. I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years back, I went to a uh, Department of Defense uh, conference. And we had these individuals, this was an admiral telling us about this. They had uh, soldiers, I believe they were um, 
SEAL team members. They were basically in Iraq and they were in MOP4 outfits. If you've never seen a MOP4, this is where they have the mask and they have this hood and they have these specialized garments that hold a lot of body heat. But in the event of a chemical attack or a biological attack, they protect the body from the pathogens, the poison gases, etc. Now, if you've never been to Iraq, on a, on, on a regular summer day, you have temperatures up to 140. These guys were in, uh, con, in containerized structures. They were going through drills, mm -hmm. etc. And the tragedy was that, as the Admiral said, because of the extreme heat, the sweating, and everything else, even though they were consuming a large amount of water, in those suits, 5 to 10% of their units would end up with kidney stones. Now, that's because they had gotten seriously dehydrated, despite the amount of water they were consuming, and they had extreme heat stress. And so what happened is, as the urine was coming out, it was highly concentrated, and you started to have, um, basically, you were starting to have um, the formation of solutes coming out of the soluble, soluble site because the water concentration was so low and so they were precipitating they were forming uh, crystals forming kidney uh, stones and so as the admiral said you know that doesn't seem like much by some people's estimation but if you have an entire unit where five to ten percent of them have to go in for kidney stones they're not available for combat that's a real disaster especially in specialized warfare like chemical and biological and I can understand what he was saying. Now, the term dysuria is painful or difficult urination. This can occur with cystitis, a bladder infection, or urethritis, so the ureter has inflammation. There's also the problems of increased urgency. This is a strong desire or frequency, which is the increased need to urinate. Yet the total amount of urine is normal. Uh, sometimes these are indications of some type of urinary tract infection or some other neurological problem. There are some terms I want you to be aware of also. Polyurea, the production of excessive amounts of urine. Oligourea, production of abnormally low amounts of urine. Anurea, failure of kidneys to produce urine. Now, a couple of other terms to be very important. Incontinence is the inability to control urination. Stress incontinence and voluntary emission of urine when pressure within the abdomen increases suddenly, such as when coughing or jumping, etc. Now, there's also urge incontinence, sudden involuntary uh, contraction of the muscular wall of the bladder causing urinary urgency, an immediate unstoppable urge to urinate. There's also overflow incontinence, a continual slow trickle of urine from an always full bladder. Okay? The variety of means that can happen, but I want you to be aware of these um, terms and terminologies. Clinical signs of urinary system disorders. Well, urinary retention. Renal function is normal, but the urination does not occur. Edema. And that is where you have, um, well, if you have protein urea, protein in the urine, if the proteins are lost in the urine, Fluid buildup in tissues will occur. If you remember what edema is, you have the buildup of fluid in tissues. Now, how can that happen? Well, if you go through normal uh, blood flowing through capillaries, you have certain fluid that goes out of the capillary, but then it's supposed to be re-brought back in before the capillary comes back into the venule. But if the total protein content in the blood is dropping, particularly because it's being uh, showing up in the urine, you're being, losing these proteins, then you've got a problem because you're going to have more fluid remain in tissues. Finally, a couple of other signs. Fever. This can be uh, common with urinary tract infection. It commonly develops with the UTI. Cystitis is the urinary black bladder infection, and it may result in a low-grade fever, Kidney infections, pyelonephritis, this can result in very high fevers, okay, because you're going to have inflammation as well as whatever the infectious agent is. And we can see here, 
the different concepts that are discussed. <laughs> so you're done. Great job. Now, a couple of things. Uh, you want to re uh, peruse the chapter review outline. That's page uh, 967 and 969. Complete the review questions on 970 and 971. Complete the review sheets, though, that you see in that chapter which is on pages 942, 960, and 966. Now, the next chapter we're going to be going into is fluid, electrolyte, and acid-basic balance. This is going to help reinforce what you did with the lab on acid bases, uh, respiratory and metabolic acid base uh, imbalances. And this kind of segues from the renal into this particular topic, which we'll get into in the next uh, lecture. Have a great day.